I'll be last. Welcome. I'm Pastor Bomi Kim from Bauman High United Methodist Church. Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness our faith. As we celebrate the life of Irene Hale, we come together in our grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Dying Christ, dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Irene put on Christ. So in Christ, may Irene be clothed with glory. Hear it now, dear friends. We are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when God appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see God as God is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure.
All, almost 50 years of my life. Um, and so uh, this is, I think, as hard for me as it is for you. Uh, on the way in, and he handed me a cross, and uh, for years, uh, as the pastor would process in, he would hand the cross to Irene, and she would spend the service praying while the service was going on. And so we, we continue that uh, this afternoon with the cross, and now I'm holding it. Uh, I'm going to be talking, but praying too. Receive then the word of grace. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Because I live, you shall live also. Our first hymn is Morning Has Broken. Morning has broken. God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Holy God, before you our hearts are open, and from you no secrets are hidden. We confess there are times we have neither sought nor done your will. We have not been truthful in our hearts in our speech, in our lives. We have not loved as we owe to love. Speak to us once more your solemn message of love. Help us, heal us, and raise us into a better life that we may end our days in peace, trusting in your kindness unto the end. Amen. You may be seated. Siblings, listen, and I will tell you a mystery. We have the opportunity to put on imperishability. Irene has joined the church triumphant, and the grace of God, the love of God for you, means that you have that opportunity too. We're still going to make mistakes. No one is perfect. No one is perfect. We are each of us going on to perfection. So know today that God loves you. Amen. Today's 
scripture comes from Hebrew Bible lesson, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 through 8, 28 through 31. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that she her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, a voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not faint or grow weary. God's understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. New Testament lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I have over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not ir ir irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I responded like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror, that, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remained. Three, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Amen.
Irene Baker Hale was born May 5, 1941, at Seaside Hospital in Long Beach, California. She graduated Long Beach Poly High in 1959, graduated Cal State with a degree in education and elementary education credential, and then a Master of Education from Cal State Long Beach. She married Andy on December 21st, 1963, at Long Beach First United Methodist Church. They were married for 56 years. They have three daughters, Mary, Amanda, and Susan, six grandchildren, Zoe, North, Ellery, Andrew, Lillian, Sophia. Now, Irene taught kindergarten for 30 years in the inner city of Long Beach uh, at, in the Unified School District. There's a QR code in the back of the uh, bulletin you can use to uh, donate a book to the library there. She was a spiritual leader uh, of her church community, uh, uh, especially a prayer leader. Um, George asked me to ask if, if you were pastored by or pastored to Irene uh, Stand, but that's going to be everybody, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, I will always remember her as my choir teacher who taught me that there is no H in music. <laughs> for many years, Irene was a leader for Campfire Boys and Girls and PTA and school music programs. Their home was a second home and a safe house for many of their children's friends, many of them who still call her mom. Again, Irene joined the church triumphant March 5th, 2020 here in Long Beach, California. She is survived by her children, her grandchildren, her sons-in-law, and of course, Andy. Irene will be remembered by all of us and by all of those whose lives she has touched. Amen. Old school. <laughs> it is my profound honor to be Andy's voice today. I want to tell you a love story. Oh, it started long ago, but there are some of you here today who were there when it started. It is the story of a boy and the cute little girl who sat two seats behind him in the seventh grade. The relationship did not get off to a good start. For the first two weeks, he called her toots. She thought, how gauche. He wasn't gauche. He didn't know her name and was too shy to ask. He must have had some redeeming qualities because in the eighth grade, he asked her to go steady and to his great delight, she said yes. He spent a dollar for a big nickel-plated brass ring and she put it on a chain and wore it around her neck. They walked hand in hand around school. He carried her books and everyone knew that they were going steady. The girl had a younger sister, Mary, who had a close friend, Carleen. Several years after this, uh, a dear, this dear friend, Carleen, told him that she remembered them watching the girl put the ring around her neck as she got ready for the monthly ninth grade dance. Carleen said that she and Mary were so envious. The Friday night, the Friday nighters dance, oh, they were wonderful. They played all kinds of music. Some of it was fast. The fast dances, the boy watched as she danced with a friend of theirs who had been a child actor and loved to dance. But they also played soft and slow music. All of those, the boy and the girl danced together. Earth Angel was one of the songs that was their song. She never reached five feet tall, and he had not yet taken his growth spurt. That would send him past six feet. It was great, 
They could dance cheek to cheek as he held both of her hands behind her as they danced ever so slowly. To this day, he doesn't remember if their feet were even moving. The vice principal walked around with a flashlight to make sure that no hanky-panky took place. He stood about 10 feet behind the girl, shined the flashlight on them, and in a low voice that could be heard throughout the room, he said, what's the matter? Are both of her arms broken? He sure knew how to spoil the mood. One of the boy's friends said, she goes to church where I go. Would you like to come to church with us? Evangelism. The boy said, sure. Thus was added another teenage boy to the church roster. High school went fast. They did not always go steady during high school, but they were always best friends. She was a member of the girls' drill team, and he played football. They were marching partners. College began a three-year period when they would be separated by hundreds of miles, yet always together. She spent her first two years at the College of the Pacific in Stockton, and he spent the first year and a half at Long Beach City College, then a year and a half at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. While he was at Cal Poly, she would bake cookies 12 dozen at a time and send them to him. The guys in his dorm rude voted her the best girlfriend of the dorm. <laughs> they would each reserve a phone booth in their dorm lobby and he would call her. In those days, there wasn't any direct dial. You called the operator and said you wanted to place a long distance call. The operator would place the call in the ring back when you hung up and she told you how much money you needed to put in. He would lay a stack of quarters on the phone booth shelf and watch his watch so that when, uh, watch it stop so the bill equaled the number of quarters that he had. One night, when the operator rang back and told him how much money he needed to deposit, the operator said, my, that must be someone very special. He softly replied, oh yes, she is. He wrote to her two or three times a week and she wrote back to him, although not as often. Once after not receiving a letter for over a week, he sent her roommate a letter of condolence on the death of her roommate. <laughs> he said that he knew she must be dead because he had not received a letter for a week and a half. He soon received a letter. She spent one semester at Cal Berkeley. A few people realized that she almost had enough units in physical sciences to qualify for a minor. While at Berkeley, her physics prof came in late one day and announced that it had been a busy day. He had just been awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. Every Thursday, she had a, also had a three-hour class with Lewis and Mary Leakey, who had just announced the first early hominid in uh, Olduval Gorge in Tanzan Tanzania. I knew I'd get that wrong. In Tanzania. She said that when they heard in class on Thursday afternoon um, was worldwide headline news on the Friday evening news. He was so proud of her. She then returned to Long Beach to attend Long Beach State College and earn a teaching credential. After the end of that year, he returned home. Cal Poly was just 240 miles too far from her. He majored in mathematics, which to him was like reading funny books. Unlike his other classes in those days, people did not understand about attention deficit disorder, dyslexia, and adolescent onset depression. Having known him since 13, she understood his reality and was his rock of support. Their engagement was announced that Christmas and the wedding the following Christmas. Looking in retrospect, he could not believe that the next phases of their lives had passed so quickly. Their three daughters, each of whom grow into women that they would have been, that they would have chosen as friends. Their home, just like their own homes had been when they were young, was the safe house for so many young people. Many of those kids called them mom and daddy. <clears throat> their loving extended family centered around their church. It started when there were young married couples, and they continued to see each other to this day. The children of the Sunday school class grew up having an extended group of parents. There was the weekly pool party for the church youth group in their backyard pool. It started with the first warm weather each year and extended weekly until the weather was too cold. 
On school days, she would hear the front door open and close, and then the refrigerator door would open. She would, use, she would mosey in to see which of those daughter's friends had come calling. <laughs> Usually there was one or two young men drinking milk and munching cookies. Her personal strength was the rock that their family was built upon. She was the most astounding person he ever knew. Her effect on their community was hard for him to quantify. He was so proud of her, and he loved her so. She was a woman of great faith. To quote her friends, she was a great prayer warrior. She lived her faith and considered the world her mission. Sunday mornings during church, as the pastor processed down, they would pause and hand her a small cross. She would hold it and pray for the pastor during the service. She was a kindergarten teacher for almost 30 years. She would have taught at any school in the district, but she chose to teach in the inner city. That was where God had placed her. When the Vietnam War ended, many of the refugees came to their church, including man, many Cambodians who spoke Khmer. Many of those students attended the school where she taught. She learned to speak Khmer and became the unofficial community worker for the Cambodian community. For many years, she was a master teacher who mentored and advised other kindergarten teachers in the district. He was so proud of her. An advantage they had in their life was their wonderful family and extended family, especially the older ones who provided role models on how to live life and how to recognize and to accept the finality of this mortal life. It taught them that just as the coming of the blossoming of the first flowers of spring, so also come the weathering of the leaves of autumn. So it was to be with the boy and the girl whom he loved so much. In the end, he would keep his promise to her. He would not leave her alone in this life. It took two months for their autumn to turn to winter. As he sits in his bedroom, furnished now by his desk, a bookshelf, a chair, boxes of letters and pictures in the closet, and a small single bed. He thinks and remembers the wonderful journey that they had shared. His daughter looks into his bedroom and lovingly says, Daddy, please don't play any country music. You know how it makes you cry. <laughs> Especially country bumpkin and will the circle be unbroken? He also thinks about how fortunate he had been to spend those years with the most amazing person he had ever known. Perhaps others remember other versions, but his version is based upon the two of them walking together hand in hand, one day at a time, ending each day with a kiss and an exchange of, I love you, and then her putting her head on his chest and the two of them falling asleep together. Often in his professional life, it had literally been his duty to contemplate the unthinkable, such as you know, space stations falling out of the sky, nuclear weapons. This was different, and nothing could prepare him. One of the strengths of family and extended family is that in times such as this, they wrap their collective arms around the person and carry them through. So it was to be with him. After two months of hospital and nursing home, she told him that she was tired and wanted to go home for hospice so she could get ready to go home to God. One weekday night at the hospital, she wanted a BLT sandwich, but they would not give her one because it was not on the dietary form. He went to Polly's Pies by the traffic circle and ordered a BLT for her. Hmm. He chatted with the young lady at the counter and told her who the BLT was for. When the order came and he gave the young lady his debit card, she looked at the name on the card. The young lady asked him, was your wife a teacher? 
Yes, he replied. Did you teach at Lee Elementary School? Yes, he replied. Did you teach kindergarten? Yes, he replied. The young lady said, well, you know this. She was my kindergarten teacher. She was the most loving teacher I ever had. It is because of her that I am studying to become a kindergarten teacher. He took the BLT to the car and just sat there and had a good cry. He was so proud of her. He loved her so, and he was so scared. They took her home to their bedroom. They brought a hospital bed into their bedroom, and some loving friends at church lent him a rollaway bed so that he could sleep next to her and hold her hand at night. You see, it had been his job to hold her hand so many years. One morning, down the hall from their bedroom, their goddaughter softly said to him, you know that she is ready to go, but you are not ready to let her go, are you? He looked at her and sobbing, he replied, I know she's ready and I now must let go. The girl had chosen the treatment of morphine drops that would place her into a deep euphoric sleep to ease her transition into the church triumphant. The drops would begin after lunch that day. The boy walked down the hall to their bedroom and stopped and looked in. She was propped up sitting with a pillow. He smiled with a smile he had not seen, no, she smiled with a smile he had not seen for a long time. She looked at him and smacking her lips, gave him a message known by lovers everywhere, hey, I want a big smooch. He walked over to the bed and reached down and cradled her head in his arm. And with the other hand, he softly caressed her sweet cheek as he wrapped her hand around his head. At the end of the movie, The Princess Bride, the grandfather tells his grandson, since the beginning of the kiss, there have been five kisses rated the most passionate, the most pure. This one left them all behind. I'm here to tell you, that there is now a seventh such kiss. As their lips met, the boy and the girl closed their eyes, and from those sweet and gentle backwaters of his memories came visions of past kisses, their first passionate kiss in his car in front of her home after a date. The radio was softly playing KFWB, just as it had been planned. The DJ played Earth Angel. Other kisses from their lives flashed through his mind. Countless kisses as one was leaving the house, others, just because I love you. Then their lips parted as their eyes opened. With a voice stronger than it had been for a long time, the girl said to the boy, we have lived a wonderful life together. And then the boy heard of all of God's children exclaim, Amen. 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 Well, hi there. So, um, I had to laugh because I just looked at my uh, my little sheaf of my talk, and the first page is missing. Okay, so I know I'm supposed to introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Mary McConnell, Mary Baker McConnell. I am Irene's baby sister. She had uh, two brothers, as you heard, and uh, then she when she was born. Uh, everybody celebrated because you never know um, if you're going to get a girl in the family. So they were pretty happy. She was cute as a button. Um, and she did have those two big brothers. Uh, there was some serious teasing that uh, went on, but um, that sort of goes with the territory, I guess, of families. She was, um, and then I came along, and it was, uh, two against two. Um, and that helped, though our brothers were much bigger than we were. And somehow 
we grew up feeling like there were sort of two sets in our family, the, the boys, and they grew up and sort of moved away, and um, we were hanging out together um, after that. The, the boys made it interesting uh, growing up when you had two big brothers. We had a kitchen table. We sat across from them, Irene and I did, and um, the boys put their feet under our chairs. Uh, so um, Irene used to talk about to this day she would have put her feet around the edges of the, ar the legs of the chairs to get her feet out of the way because our brothers always had their feet under our chairs, and they would hang over our dinner plates. They would say, you don't want that, do you? You don't want that, do you? So uh, we had to defend our food as well as our, our uh, space under the table. So <coughs> now I'm trying to remember the next part. <coughs> anyway, so... Um, we did a lot of, um, when we were growing up, we did a lot of um, prep on Sunday mornings. And um, just, I remember I was supposed to say this towards the beginning, when you lost your first page, sometimes you have to be disjointed. So um, this is sort of like a slideshow for you that's verbal. So I'm going to be giving you pictures of what it was like for Irene uh, to grow up. So um, I've given you the picture of the, the dinner table. Um, and then another picture in my mind is we prepared for Sunday morning all day Saturday. We washed our hair. We dried it outside in the backyard. We washed our white gloves. We starched our petticoats. Um, there was a lot of preparation um, that doesn't happen these days, but and it sounds so old-fashioned, but it was, uh, it was a precious time for us. We sat under the hair dryer bonnets uh, for hours. Um, we did each other's manicures. Um, so uh, there was a lot of that prep that we did together. And we sewed our clothes. Um, Irene and I would go every spring. Our mom would take us to the fabric store the fabric store is Irene's favorite place outside of church, I think. And um, we'd pick out seersucker to make our shorty pajamas for the summer. And um, we made most of our clothes for uh, Sunday and um, our, most of our party clothes. So we did, um, we had to clean the house together. Um, not our favorite thing. And Irene didn't exactly like to clean the house with me because I, I was a little lazy, so um, she would, um, but we had a list we had to go by. My mother made a list every day, every day of the summer. We had a different thing we had to do to clean the house. We had to do this, we had to do that, but it was one of the ways that Irene and I learned how to take care of a house. So it was, it was good for us. We did, um, we exercised together with our mom to Jack Lane on television. <laughs> remember that, right? Um, and um, I remember Irene making and modeling beautiful circle skirts that she would wear to the Friday nighters that Andy talked about. Um, Irene, um, Irene's first creation, though, my mom used to tell me this story. Her very first creation on the sewing machine was a skirt of dubious quality, as first creations can be. And Ma she wanted to wear it out with the family to dinner that night. And my father said, Lillian, she's not going to wear that, is she? And my mom said, oh, yes, she is. Do you see how proud she is? Yes, she's going to wear that. <laughs> so my mom really stood up for her. My favorite of all Irene's creations was a wardrobe she made for her doll, Rachel. So Rachel was a jointed doll, um, not your typical kind of doll, and she made an entire period wardrobe for Rachel. She made dresses uh, with bustles, and she used antique lace from our great Aunt Irene, great Aunt Irene Reed, 
and she used mauve taffeta. She just made the most beautiful things. And it was so important to me to see that beautiful wardrobe that when um, we heard there was going to be a flood in our neighborhood and we had to evacuate to the Eckhoffs up on the hill, the first thing I said to my mom is, what about Rachel and her wardrobe? She said, Mary, it's fine. She's up high. She'll be just fine. But um, that, that just made such an impression on me. So when we were teenagers, our times were still filled with sewing. It's sort of interesting, isn't it? That really, it filled her whole life. She loved that part of creating. And um, when I went away, to, she went away to college. And then when she came back, um, that's when I really found out what a dedicated sister she was. Because until then, I was sort of a pain in the neck. Um, and she was, she was nice to me, but she, it, I, I was really annoying. So, but when I decided to go to UCLA, Irene made me an entire set of a family of bears. They were made out of corduroy. They had movable legs and arms, and they were dressed to the nines in Bruin gold and blue. And I put those on my bed in my dorm, and I just felt like he felt surrounded with love. It was, uh, it was really a powerful thing. And then um, she'd been married two years when I announced that Mike and I were going to be getting married. And I made that announcement in February that we were getting married in June. And, of course, my family said, oh, no, in August, right? I said, no, in June. So Irene made my trousseau. She started with uh, my going away outfit, which was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to go into this detail for you who are not so fascinated with fabric and clothing, but uh, these, are, these are powerful memories for me, right? So um, she made me an ice blue linen sheath with a duster, which is kind of a coat, with a white collar. It was exquisite. And she made me a morning coat, which is what I was supposed to put over my nightgown to come to, to breakfast. <laughs> and then she made me a couple of other dresses. She did that all while she was working, and she was um, taking care of Andy. And, you know, she was just really a wonderful, wonderful sister. She didn't stop there. After we got married, Irene kept sending me cookbooks. She sent me all her favorite cookbooks, and each one of them was carefully annotated. It was um, uh, great for potluck. Best sugar cookies to use with kids, or just ordinary, don't bother. <laughs> when we became parents, we became closer than ever. We compared notes, we commiserated with each other, we talked about potty training, and we knew that we could always depend on each other. Even if we were 3,000 miles apart, by that time I was living in Boston, the connection was really strong. But the highlights were when we came back to Long Beach to get our families together, and she would plan wagon rides for the little ones uh, to the duck pond, and afternoons at the beach, and sleepovers, and always delicious meals. So when I was talking with all of my family about their memories of Irene, it was fascinating to me what my kids and um, all the kids had to say about Irene's cooking. I always knew it was great, but um, my favorite was my oldest daughter, Rose. She said, when I went out to be with Aunt Irene, she made, I thought that California was a different country because the food out there was so exotic. She said, I had, um, I had bagel sandwiches. We never had bagel sandwiches where we lived. And I even had lamb pita with dill yogurt sauce. Now, you know, for somebody of my daughter's age to remember 
that much detail about a meal way back when she was 13, you know it had to be really powerful. And her, um, Emily, my middle daughter, said, when Aunt Irene suggested that they make sun tea, she said, I was gobsmacked. Why, how in the world would you make something like sun tea? So Irene was always bringing something new about food into my kids' lives. And when I talked to her grandkids, they talked about learning how to make her potato salad and make her apple pie and how much is important that was. And then Zoe said, you know, one time we were making a Christmas cake with Aunt Irene and um, the flour exploded all over the kitchen. <laughs> and she thought, oh my golly, what is Aunt Irene going to say? And of course, what Irene did was she laughed hysterically and then helped her clean it up because that's what Irene did. Her laughter, she was not a condemning person, right? She, was, she just would laugh all the, her troubles away. And remembering her infectious laugh really infused all those memories that people related to me. And they talked about riding in the big green machine, which is their station wagon, with all the kids in the back, singing to the high heavens with their Christmas carols and other songs and camp songs, and Irene just laughing and singing along with them. They talked about her kindness when she would, one grandchild said, I came from the East Coast. I woke up so early. It must have been three or four in the morning. And I was afraid to say anything because I didn't want to wake anybody up. And Irene came tiptoeing in. She, she anticipated that and said, you must be awake. You come on with me and we'll have a snack. She was just, and her enthusiasm, one child said, my, her enthusiasm, when she proposed an activity, she was so enthusiastic, you couldn't help but want to do it. So... Um, all of those things were infectious about Irene, her laughter and her kindness and her, um, and her enthusiasm. So some of her grandkids remembered her room being a safe haven, that she would, um, they could go in there and cuddle when all the sports came on the television in the front room. They would, they would all retire and cuddle up with Irene uh, while she sewed. And um, they would watch diners and dives and drive-ins. And they would watch Say Yes to the Dress. And they would talk and talk and talk for hours. A very precious time. Um, she really loved being a mom. And she was very, very deliberate about it. I remember she would give me advice constantly. Try this, do this, but remember all of it in love. And she read out loud to her kids. Um, Mary remembers her reading Wrinkle in Time to her. And she said, to this day, when she reads that, she hears the words in Irene's voice. And so she made sure she did the same thing for her kids. She read it to each one of her family members. She and Andy opened their home to all the kids' friends, as you've heard. No matter what was going on, the kid home was always full of the kids' friends, and they were great hosts, hosting and offering great food and great love. So when Irene went back to teaching in public school when the kids were a little older, she really made such a difference. You know, you've heard that she taught in the Cambodian community for a long time, and that group, it meant so much to her, and learning Khmer was one of the, just one of the points of pride for her. And then when we brought our son's wife home to meet her, Lynn, who was born in Phnom Penh, she gave Lynn a big hug and she said, I taught so many kids, Cambodian kids in my life, and now I have my own Cambodian family member. She was just so proud. And that's a moment that Lynn really cherishes. So then when I started teaching kindergarten again, uh, Irene and I shared kindergarten notes. 
constantly over the phone. We were sharing uh, curriculum notes. We were showing, sharing behavior techniques. Um, and it was, and she often offered to pray for children in my classroom. And that was a special gift of Irene's. She felt so close to God, and she would often ask all of us who to pray for today. She would love to walk and pray, and walk and pray. And sometimes a neighbor would say, are you okay? You've passed my house three times today. And Irene would say, I'm not done praying. <laughs> so she would talk and talk and pray and pray. She was a serious Bible student, and though she had one view of um, the Bible, she would go to other Bible studies that were perhaps not the same view as she did because she wanted to have a full range of understanding of the Bible. She dearly loved her church, too. So most of all, I think Irene loved creating things of beauty. She loved it to do that in the home. She loved to create a beautiful garden, and even in objects of love for her grandchildren. They each told me how much they love the tapestry that Irene made for each one of them. And we have some on display at the reception, so you can see them and you can see each stitch of love she put into those. She loved to decorate. And as, as Mary described it, she loved to dress the house from top to toe. She loved to have her pansies in on time. She tended to the roses, the lantana, the shrubs and the trees, always dreaming of one more beautiful plant she could put in her garden. And she was so knowledgeable that when her son-in-law took her to the botanical garden in Montreal, he came back aghast. And he said to Mary, did you know your mom knew all the names of all those plants? She could, she could identify them all. She was amazing. So I hope I've given you just a little broader picture of what Irene has been like. She was a great sister, daughter, wife, mom, aunt, and grandma, as well as an accomplished woman in her own right, and certainly worth claiming her own slideshow. I feel so fortunate to be her sister. Thank you, that was very well done. Uh, we have an open mic opportunity, so if you feel like you have something to share of Irene, please uh, come up and uh, take a moment or two. If it feels like it's too much, there is always the opportunity to share stories in the time of fellowship uh, at the uh, conclusion as well. But if you wish to, to share a memory of Irene, uh, now is uh, the time to do that. We've got at least one coming up, by all means, please. It's a pleasure to be here today. <clears throat> um, I am here representing the Camp family. Uh, ben and Diana, they would have loved to have been here. Um, and Paul and I are here representing. What a beautiful love story, Andy. I saw it when I came here. Irene, when, you, when I look up the word angel in the dictionary, I saw Irene Hale written there. What a doll. One of my first memories of Irene was sitting in this sanctuary, and this church at the time had this, the, the sweetest uh, moment because the church was small where uh, when the pastor was gone, Irene would collect the prayer requests. And I remember her, she would come down. Now and then, just 
go wherever the prayer request came from. And that is one of the, the main things that I remember about her. Uh, Andy and Irene used to come to a little Bible study that our son, who is here, um, and he experienced from Irene the exchanging of the cross, and he remembers that. But I remember during a tough time in my life as a teacher, as a special education teacher, Irene would always check in with me and say, how's it going? I'm praying for you. What a delightful person. I've been, our family, so blessed by her. Thank you for sharing this, all of, all of this. Her sister, um, your family, God bless you all. Thank you. I know almost every face in this place. The first day that I was here was for a baptism. And I had chose to come here because my best friend had her, her daughter baptized here. And um, when I came back, I felt very much at home. And the pastor's wife at that time, she says, she came to me and she said, we're having a ladies' tea. You should come. So I said, okay, I'll do that. And at that ladies' tea, she said, we're having a women's retreat. You should come. And it was at that women's retreat that I first met Irene. We were going to be in the same room. We, I don't know if we had been already signed up for that or if it just happened at that moment. But I know that when we got there, she was like happy, like, will you be in my room? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, somebody else as small as I am. This is wonderful. <laughs> and during one of the first meetings, um, we were splitting apart to pray with people. And I went in to pray with Irene. And I feel like our souls have been connected ever since. And, and and that's, someone had said that she was a prayer warrior, and I was like, yeah, she is. Um, and I was there at their house when, it, it was Christmas, when it was, we need to go to the hospital. And so we got her to the hospital, and it was a few months later when it was time for her to go to hospice. And she said, I need to go home so I can go home. And on, from that day until her last day, I stayed with her, with the family. And um, at one point she said, it's so nice having my good friend here to take care of me. And I was, And I said, you know, I wouldn't be any other place. But I knew that it would be very difficult. And I had called my sister, who was a nurse, and she had been there for the hospice care of my high school best friend. And so I said, what do I do? And she said, you can do it. It is difficult, but it's also an honor. And I was like, you know what? That is very true. And she had always been there to guide me spiritually, which is why I called her my, my godmother. Because my grandparents were my first godparents, and they had long passed. And so that was just a very special relationship. And it was on that night on, on the 4th, she had said to me that she was ready. And she asked me to help her. Everything in those last days was done as she asked. 
everything that she had planned, everything that she needed. And I held her hand and I said, I've got you. And Andy took me home and he spent that last night with her. And it, just as she wanted, just as she needed, just as the whole family needed. And sometimes people wonder, well, are they in heaven? <laughs> I think that God already had the pearly gates open. And I mean, <laughs> I think <laughs> if there's a car to drive you up there, I think Peter was driving it. There was no question. <laughs> If we didn't see the sun, it was because it was guiding her. <laughs> Any of us, even if you didn't really know her, but you met her, she made your life brighter. <laughs> My life is better for having known her. <laughs> and I wasn't sure who you were for a second. And I'm like, like it, when you walked around the corner, and as soon as I saw your face, oh, yep, that's her sister. <laughs> I, my sisters are twins, and you two look more alike than my si twin sisters. <laughs> and um, when you, anyone who's met Irene, you know what love is. Thanks. I have a couple of stories to share that uh, Mary collected from uh, some of the other cousins. This, these are memories from Tom and Julie. Um, one of Tom is one of Charles's uh, three, three, four sons, <laughs> uh, and uh, Julie's his wife. Um, <clears throat> Tom's memory was from when he returned from. Uh, October of 81 from his church mission in Sendai, Japan. And on his way home, he remembered mentioning to his parents that he was looking forward to an American meal after all this Japanese food. And he had a layover in Los Angeles, and Irene and Andy picked him up, took him home, and surprised him with a dinner of roast beef, mashed potatoes, and all the fixings. American food had never tasted so good. <laughs> um, right. After dinner and a full stomach, they took him back to the airport and sent him off to Salt Lake. Yeah. That was his <laughs> recollection of the uh, wonderful cooking and hospitality of Virginia. Uh, Julie's memory, <clears throat> it was in August of 1987. She, Tom, and Jeff headed to Long Beach to see Grandma Lillian. They're just in time for the annual luau. Anybody who knew the bakers knew about the July luau, well, August luau, I guess you said, um, which was used to celebrate Grandma's birthday, Grandma Lillian's birthday, Mary Hale's birthday, and others as well. They had a bunch of July and August uh, birthdays. I remember when I started dating in the family, that was a great thing to come to as well. Anyway, um, her visit, her, uh, Julie's visit, uh, Julie's memory from that visit was preparing traditional luau food with Grandma Lillian in the kitchen. They cooked, laughed, and they collected recipes for Julie to take with her of the pork and bananas foster. Remember bananas foster? Mm, yeah, that's right. Uh, this experience prompted Tom and Julie to have a luau-themed engagement party for their daughter Lauren and their new son-in-law in Philip in 2014, and they plan to do the same this summer for Preston and his fiance Shauna. Another bigger luau. Irene was an amazing, talented woman. She was fun to be around, a great cook, 
and had an infectious giggle that got everybody laughing. May you rest in God's peace and care, watching over your legacy, your husband, children, and grandchildren, Irene. Love, Julie, Tom, and the family. I'm Sharon. I came to Long Beach as a Navy wife, therefore I had no family, but God blessed me with the McConnell Fellowship class, John sitting back there, and, uh, and these were my, and as my husband would say, our brothers and sisters, that's what we called them, and there was a couple of things, Andy, that will jog your memory. Uh, I called her the sewing lady, because I could hardly sew anything. <laughs> And if you needed a recipe, you called Irene. She knew all the recipes, I'll tell you. She led us when we had Circle 16 and had, she inherited from her mother's group the souffle, the spring brunch. So we all, she helped us cook the souffle down at church. We each brought our lemon squares in the pies too. And then as Circle, uh, George's mother was the real painter. But Jim's mother was a painter also, as was Irene, and we painted jar lids for, for the bazaar, you see. And we had our meetings. We ran up and down Palo Verde Avenue, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, she did say to me when I had children and he would be out to sea, well, just bring the children down here and we'll do it together, you know, or have food together when I would be alone. In her retirement, she joined me at CBS Bible Study and really enjoyed it. In fact, sometimes we talked to Miss Willow Street and we had to go one up and around, but we didn't care. She told me, just tell them that, well, we avoided an accident. Maybe there would have been an accident on that street. See, so I learned how to do that. And, uh, and then when that broke up later on and she retired, we joined uh, Los Altos Circle. And they wanted us to lead, so the both of us led, and we said we each had a half a brain. So between the two of us, we had one brain. We could lead these 90-year-old ladies, you know. So anyway, why, that was a good part of it. And she did brag, too, that her future son-in-law, Jim, was at her wedding. She said, now, not many people can say that. So, But if I had a prayer concern, that's who I talked to. If I had a concern about raising children, that's who I spoke to. So she was really, among other people, I had blessed with many sisters, as my husband was blessed with many brothers. And this was something that uh, you could not put a description to as to what she meant to our family. Uh, so I have one more family story. Um, so we used to camp a lot. Um, we camped in uh, Sequoia National Park. We camped in uh, uh, down below San Jacinto in uh, the Marion uh, Campground and uh, Black Creek Campground. Um, and we camped in the desert, too. And uh, we went with the Ekoffs a lot. And um, one night... Um, we were sleeping in the Boy Scout teepee, the big uh, canvas teepee that was made out of the aluminum poles. And Goldie, uh, my aunt, was uh, with us girls in the tent. And I think John, because you were kind of little. Anyway, uh, well, you were in those days. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, we were all flat on our backs, sleeping in our sleeping bags. And a big wind came up, 
Bill was in the truck with his dad listening to the baseball game. And it, it was such a big wind, we could hardly see the truck from the, from the teepee. Anyway, all of a sudden, the tent falls down on us. Goldie was lying flat on her back, holding up one of the tents, and she was screaming, Irene, can you breathe? Irene, can you breathe? And, and Irene was on the other side. She couldn't get out. So I had to go over to the truck through the sandstorm and net bang on the truck to say, uh, Bill, Eki, you know, come and help us. So uh, that was just one of our camping experiences. We had so much fun together as families. Speaking of the teepees, our scout, our scout troop had teepees that uh, I helped build in 1959, I think. I spent a year of my life in them. But we took them to a campfire camp once. And uh, uh, Mary was the oldest, and Mandy and Susan were little ones, so they stayed in our teepee. And the other girls had their teepee. In the middle of the night, we heard... Thump, me, thump, me. Irene looked over at Elbow and says, Our TP is being TP'd. Hi, uh, my name is Susan, and I attended First Church downtown with Andy and Irene many years ago, and they've both been such a wonderful presence in my life. And I specifically remember one day, and Mary, you made me think of this, talking about how Irene is such a prayer warrior, which indeed she was. Um, I was having a terrible time with anxiety and who knows what, and I remember I was up all night having an honest-to-goodness panic attack. I don't remember why, but it was a terrible night. I had got no sleep, woke up Sunday morning, and just was a wreck. Could hardly get out of bed. I was so tired. And I thought, I need to go to church. And I sort of staggered over to services that morning. And Irene Hale was the first person I saw. And she said, how you doing, hun? I said, I don't feel good. And she, I mean, she only came up to here, but she threw her arms around me and started praying over my head. And I thought, oh yeah, I knew I needed to be here. And that was the power that Irene had wherever you encountered her. I'm a little choked up. Um, I used to go to this church with my mom, Jessica. Um, fond memories. Um, my son, Santiago, was actually baptized here. Uh, our first church, first Easter. Um, how can you put in words how beautiful this woman was? Um, at a crazy time, um, I was homeless. and I was staying in a shelter. I was incredibly stressed. And she could see it. It was hard for me to accept that the situation I was in, it was a hard one. But the strength and the love of this woman, as I sat down, she sat down next to me. And she talked to me every single time that I came to church. And it always felt like home. Because Andy, I mean, my goodness, you were always telling me things about Santiago, like, oh, be part of the Boy Scouts, and, and let's do this, and we're doing this on Saturday, and we're doing this on Sunday. And then Irene, she just had this powerful, amazing influence that she spoke to you, and you felt like it was home. You felt like you were comforted. You felt like you were loved. You felt like you were protected. 
And any situation I had, I felt really like I could just tell her, like she was an open book. I felt like she was a safe haven. Um, I just remember talking to her about my son. She's like, oh, he's teething. You could do this, you could do that. Um, I just have to say how beautiful an example of love you guys both were. It was just impeccable. Like I, I don't really have an example to, to concur, but seeing you guys love each other, like it was just, just impeccable. I, like you don't see love like that anymore. You really don't. And um, I'm just blessed and honored to be a part of this church. Um, I don't see you guys all the time. I see you guys on Facebook all the time. I'm a representative of my mom, my brother, Jonathan Emanuel, my son, Santiago. Um, but I can tell you that she was the bright light of this church. And she made her presence known in so many ways. And I'm honored and blessed to be here. I love you, Andy. I love your family. God bless you.
was going to play, but it did. <laughs> Would you be in prayer with me, please? Almighty God, you have shared with us the life of Irene, and before she was ours, she is yours. For all that Irene has given of herself to make us what and who we are, for that part of her which lives and grows in each of us, and for her life that in your love will never end, we give you thanks. As now we offer Irene back into your arms, comfort us in our loneliness, strengthen us in our weakness, and give us courage to face the future unafraid. God of us all, your love never ends. When all else fails, you still are God. We pray to you for all another in our need and to all anywhere to who mourn with us this day, to those who adopt, give light, to those who are weak, strength, to all who have sinned, mercy, to all who sorrow, your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another, as even as your own love for us stays true. God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day, for the gift of joy in days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends, and for our acceptance and place in your family, with all who have faithfully lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knows our grief, who died our death, and yet lives for our sake. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you are able, please stand and receive this, this benediction. And now... May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. I want to come down and excuse you by row. So those in the front who are family, well, a chance to go to the back, and you can say a, a word or two in passing, uh, and then by all means join us down in the talk. But as I come by. <laughs> Thank you.